dedicated to the Lenin enrollment J.V. Stalin. The foundations of Leninism is a big subject. To exhaust it, a whole volume would be required. Indeed, a number of volumes would be required. Naturally, therefore, my lectures cannot be an exhaustive exposition of Leninism. At best, they can only offer a concise synopsis of the foundations of Leninism. Nevertheless, I consider it useful to give this synopsis in order to lay down some basic points of departure necessary for the successful study of Leninism. Expounding the foundations of Leninism still does not mean expounding the basis of Lenin's world outlook. Lenin's world outlook and the foundations of Leninism are not identical in scope. Lenin was a Marxist, and Marxism is, of course, the basis of his world outlook. But from this it does not at all follow that an exposition of Leninism ought to begin with an exposition of the foundations of Marxism. To expound Leninism means to expound the distinctive and new in the works of Lenin that Lenin contributed to the general treasury of Marxism, and that is naturally connected with his name. Only in this sense will I speak in my lectures of the foundations of Leninism. And so, what is Leninism? Some say that Leninism is the application of Marxism to the conditions that are peculiar to the situation in Russia. This definition contains a particle of truth, but not the whole truth by any means. Lenin indeed applied Marxism to Russian conditions and applied it in a masterly way. But if Leninism were only the application of Marxism to the conditions that are peculiar to Russia, it would be a purely national and only a national, a purely Russian and only a Russian phenomenon. We know, however, that Leninism is not merely a Russian, but an international phenomenon, rooted in the whole of international development. That is why I think this definition suffers from one-sidedness. Others say that Leninism is the revival of the revolutionary elements of Marxism of the 40s of the 19th century, as distinct from the Marxism of subsequent years, when, it is alleged, it became moderate, non-revolutionary. If we disregard this foolish and vulgar division of the teachings of Marx into two parts, revolutionary and moderate, we must admit that even this totally inadequate and unsatisfactory definition contains a particle of truth. This particle of truth is that Lenin did indeed restore the revolutionary content of Marxism, which had been suppressed by the opportunists of the Second International. Still, that is but a particle of the truth. The whole truth about Leninism is that Leninism not only restored Marxism, but also took a step forward, developing Marxism further under the new conditions of capitalism and of the class struggle of the proletariat. What then, in the last analysis, is Leninism? Leninism is Marxism of the era of imperialism and the proletarian revolution. To be more exact, Leninism is the theory and tactics of the proletarian revolution in general, the theory and tactics of the dictatorship of the proletariat in particular. Marx and Engels pursued their activities in the pre-revolutionary period when developed imperialism did not yet exist, in the period of the proletarian's preparation for revolution, in the period when the proletarian revolution was not yet an immediate practical inevitability. But Lenin, the disciple of Marx and Engels, pursued his activities in the period of developed imperialism, in the period of the unfolding proletarian revolution, when the proletarian revolution had already triumphed in one country, had smashed bourgeois democracy, and had ushered in the era of proletarian democracy, the era of the Soviets. That is why Leninism is the further development of Marxism. It is usually to point to the exceptionally militant and exceptionally revolutionary character of Leninism. This is quite correct, but this specific feature of Leninism is due to two causes. Firstly, to the fact that Leninism emerged from the proletarian revolution, the imprint of which it cannot but bear. Secondly, to the fact that it grew and became strong in clashes with the opportunism of the Second International, the fight against which was and remains an essential preliminary condition for a successful fight against capitalism. It must not be forgotten that between Marx and Engels, on the one hand, and Lenin, on the other, there lies a whole period of undivided domination of the opportunism of the Second International, and the ruthless struggle against this opportunism could not but constitute one of the most important tasks of Leninism. The historical roots of Leninism, Leninism grew up and took shape under the conditions of imperialism, when the contradictions of capitalism had reached an extreme point, when the proletarian revolution had become an immediate practical question, when the old period of preparation of the working class for revolution had arrived at and passed into a new period, that of direct assault on capitalism. Lenin called imperialism moribund capitalism. Why? Because imperialism carries the contradictions of capitalism to their last bounds, to the extreme limit, beyond which revolution begins. Of these contradictions, there are three which must be regarded as the most important. The first contradiction is the contradiction between labor and capital. Imperialism is the omnipotence of the monopolist trusts and syndicates, of the banks and the financial oligarchy in the industrial countries. In the fight against this omnipotence, the customary methods of the working class trade unions and cooperatives, parliamentary parties, and the parliamentary struggle have proved to be totally inadequate. Either place yourself at the mercy of capital, eke out a wretched existence as of old and sink lower and lower, or adopt a new weapon. This is the alternative imperialism puts before the vast masses of the proletariat. Imperialism brings the working class to revolution. The second contradiction is the contradiction among the various financial groups and imperialist powers in their struggle for sources of raw materials for foreign territory. Imperialism is the export of capital to the sources of raw materials, 
the frenzied struggle for monopolist possession of these sources, the struggle for a redivision of the already divided world, a struggle waged with particular fury by new financial groups and powers seeking a place in the sun against the old groups and powers which cling tenaciously to what they have seized. Inging of the imperialists to the weakening of the position of capitalism in general, to the acceleration of the advent of the proletarian revolution and to the practical necessity of this revolution. The third contradiction is the contradiction between the handful of ruling, civilized nations and the hundreds of millions of the colonial and dependent peoples of the world. Imperialism is the most barefaced exploitation and the most inhuman oppression of hundreds of millions of people inhabiting vast colonies and dependent countries. The purpose of this exploitation and of this oppression is to squeeze out super profits. But in exploiting these countries, imperialism is compelled to build their railways, factories and mills, industrial and commercial centers. The appearance of a class of proletarians, the emergence of a native intelligentsia, the awakening of national consciousness, the growth of the liberation movement, such are the inevitable results of this policy. The growth of the revolutionary movement in all colonies and dependent countries without exception clearly testifies to this fact. This circumstance is of importance for the proletariat inasmuch as it saps radically the position of capitalism by converting the colonies and dependent countries from reserves of imperialism into reserves of the proletarian revolution. Such in general are the principal contradictions of imperialism which have converted the old, flourishing capitalism into moribund capitalism. The significance of the imperialist war, which broke out 10 years ago, lies, among other things, in the fact that it gathered all these contradictions into a single knot and threw them onto the scales, thereby accelerating and facilitating the revolutionary battles of the proletariat. In other words, imperialism was instrumental not only in making the revolution a practical inevitability, but also in creating favorable conditions for a direct assault on the citadels of capitalism. Such was the international situation which gave birth to Leninism. Some may say, this is all very well, but what has it to do with Russia, which was not and could not be a classical land of imperialism? Alism. Because Russia, more than any other country, was pregnant with revolution, and she alone, therefore, was in a position to solve those contradictions in a revolutionary way. To begin with, Tsarist Russia was the home of every kind of oppression, capitalist, colonial, and militarist, in its most inhuman and barbarous form. Who does not know that in Russia the omnipotence of capital was combined with the despotism of Tsarism, the aggressiveness of Russian nationalism with Tsarism's role of executioner in regard to the non-Russian peoples, the exploitation of entire regions, Turkey, Persia, China, with the seizure of these regions by Tsarism with wars of conquest? Lenin was right in saying that Tsarism was military feudal imperialism. Tsarism was the concentration of the worst features of imperialism, raised to a high pitch. To proceed. Tsarist Russia was a major reserve of Western imperialism, not only in the sense that it gave free entry to foreign capital, which controlled such basic branches of Russia's national economy as the fuel and metallurgical industries, but also in the sense that it could supply the Western imperialists with millions of soldiers. Remember the Russian army, 14 million strong, which shed its blood on the imperialist fronts to safeguard the staggering profits of the British and French capitalists. Further, Tsarism was not only the watchdog of imperialism in the east of Europe, but in addition, it was the agent of Western imperialism for squeezing out of the population hundreds of millions by way of interest on loans obtained in Paris and London, Berlin and Brussels. Finally, Tsarism was a most faithful ally of Western imperialism in the partition of Turkey, Persia, China, etc. Who does not know that the imperialist war was waged by Tsarism in alliance with the imperialists of the Entente and that Russia was an essential element in that war? That is why the interests of Tsarism and of Western imperialism were interwoven and ultimately became merged in a single skein of imperialist interests. Could Western imperialism resign itself to the loss of such a powerful support in the East and of such a rich reservoir of manpower and resources as old, czarist, bourgeois Russia was, without exerting all its strength to wage a life-and-death struggle against the revolution in Russia, with the object of defending and preserving czarism? Of course not. But from this it follows that whoever wanted to strike at czarism necessarily raised his hand against imperialism. Whoever rose against czarism had to rise against imperialism as well. For whoever was bent on overthrowing czarism had to overthrow imperialism too if he really intended not merely to defeat Tsarism, but to make a clean sweep of it. Thus the revolution against Tsarism verged on and had to pass into a revolution against imperialism, into a proletarian revolution. Meanwhile, in Russia, a tremendous popular revolution was rising, headed by the most revolutionary proletariat in the world, which possessed such an important ally as the revolutionary peasantry of Russia. Does it need proof that such a revolution could not stop halfway, that in the event of success, it was bound to advance further and raise the banner of revolt against imperialism? That is why Russia was bound to become the focus of the contradictions of imperialism, not only in the sense that it was in Russia that these contradictions were revealed most plainly, in view of their particularly repulsive and particularly intolerable character, and not only because Russia was a highly important prop of Western imperialism, connecting Western finance capital with the colonies in the East, but also because Russia was the only country in which there existed a real force 
capable of resolving the contradictions of imperialism in a revolutionary way. From this it follows, however, that the revolution in Russia could not but become a proletarian revolution, that from its very inception it could not but assume an international character, and that, therefore, it could not but shake the very foundations of world imperialism. Under these circumstances, could the Russian communists confine their work within the narrow national bounds of the Russian Revolution? Of course not. On the contrary, the whole situation, both internal and external, impelled them to go beyond these bounds in their work, to transfer the struggle to the international arena, to expose the ulcers of imperialism, to prove that the collapse of capitalism was inevitable, to smash social chauvinism and social pacifism, and finally, in capitalism for the proletarians of all countries. Nor could the Russian communists act otherwise, for only this path offered the chance of producing certain changes in the international situation, which could safeguard Russia against the restoration of the bourgeois order. That is why Russia became the home of Leninism, and why Lenin, the leader of the Russian communists, became its creator. The same thing approximately happened in the case of Russia and Lenin, as in the case of Germany and Marx and Engels in the 40s of the last century. Germany at that time was pregnant with bourgeois revolution, just like Russia at the beginning of the 20th century. Marx wrote at that time in the Communist Manifesto, the communists turn their attention chiefly to Germany because that country is on the eve of a bourgeois revolution that is bound to be carried out under more advanced conditions of European civilization and with a much more developed proletariat than that of England was in the 17th and of France in the 18th century. And because the bourgeois revolution in Germany will be but the prelude to an immediately following proletarian revolution. In other words, the center of the revolutionary movement was shifting to Germany. There can hardly be any doubt that it was this very circumstance, noted by Marx in the above quoted passage, that served as the probable reason why it was precisely Germany that became the birthplace of scientific socialism, and why the leaders of the German proletariat, Marx and Engels, became its creators. The same, only to a still greater degree, must be said of Russia at the beginning of the 20th century. Russia was then on the eve of a bourgeois revolution, she had to accomplish this revolution at a time when conditions in Europe were more advanced and with a proletariat that was more developed than that of Germany in the 40s of the 19th century. Moreover, all the evidence went to show that this revolution was bound to serve as a ferment and as a prelude to the proletarian revolution. We cannot regard it as accidental that as early as 1902, when the Russian revolution was still in an embryonic state, Lenin wrote the prophetic words in his pamphlet, What is to be done? History has now confronted us with an immediate task which is the most revolutionary of all the immediate tasks that confront the proletariat of any country. The fulfillment of this task, the destruction of the most powerful bulwark, not only of European, but also of Asiatic reaction, would make the Russian proletariat the vanguard of the international revolutionary proletariat. In other words, the center of the revolutionary movement was bound to shift to Russia. As we know, the course of the revolution in Russia has more than vindicated Lenin's prediction. Is it surprising, after all this, that a country which has accomplished such a revolution and possesses such a proletariat should have been the birthplace of the theory and tactics of the proletarian revolution? Is it surprising that Lenin, the leader of Russia's proletariat, became also the creator of this theory and tactics and the leader of the international proletariat? Method, I have already said that between Marx and Engels, on the one hand, and Lenin, on the other, there lies a whole period of domination of the opportunism of the Second International. For the sake of exactitude, I must add that it is not the formal domination of opportunism I have in mind, but only its actual domination. Formally, the Second International was headed by faithful Marxists, by the Orthodox Kautsky and others. Actually, however, the main work of the Second International followed the line of opportunism. The opportunists adapted themselves to the bourgeoisie because of their adaptive, petty bourgeois nature. The Orthodox, in their turn, adapted themselves to the opportunists in order to preserve unity with them in the interests of peace within the party. Thus the link between the policy of the bourgeoisie and the policy of the orthodox was closed, and as a result, opportunism reigned supreme. This was the period of the relatively peaceful development of capitalism, the pre-war period, so to speak, when the catastrophic contradictions of imperialism had not yet become so glaringly evident, when workers' economic strikes and trade unions were developing more or less normally, when election campaigns and parliamentary groups yielded dizzying successes, when legal forms of struggle were lauded to the skies, and when it was thought that capitalism would be killed by legal means, in short, when the parties of the Second International were living in clover and had no inclination to think seriously about revolution, about the dictatorship of the proletariat, about the revolutionary education of the masses. Instead of an integral revolutionary theory, there were contradictory theoretical postulates and fragments of theory, which were divorced from the actual revolutionary struggle of the masses and had been turned into threadbare dogmas. For the sake of appearances, Marx's theory was mentioned, of course, but only to rob it of its living revolutionary spirit. Tie-ins and slogans were adopted, but only to be pigeonholed. 
instead of the party being trained and taught correct revolutionary tactics on the basis of its own mistakes, there was a studied evasion of vexed questions, which were glossed over and veiled. For the sake of appearances, of course, there was no objection to talking about vexed questions, but only in order to wind up with some sort of elastic resolution. Such was the physiognomy of the Second International, its method of work, its arsenal. Meanwhile, a new period of imperialist wars and of revolutionary battles of the proletariat was approaching. The old methods of fighting were proving obviously inadequate and impotent in the face of the omnipotence of finance capital. It became necessary to overhaul the entire activity of the Second International, its entire method of work, and to drive out all philistinism, narrow-mindedness, political scheming, renegacy, social chauvinism, and social pacifism. It became necessary to examine the entire arsenal of the Second International, to throw out all that was rusty and antiquated, to forge new weapons. Without this preliminary work, it was useless embarking upon war against capitalism. Without this work, the proletariat ran the risk of finding itself inadequately armed, or even completely unarmed, in the future revolutionary battles. The honor of bringing about this general overhauling and general cleansing of the Augean stables of the Second International fell to Leninism. Such were the conditions under which the method of Leninism was born and hammered out. What are the requirements of this method? Firstly, the testing of the theoretical dogmas of the Second International in the crucible of the revolutionary struggle of the masses, in the crucible of living practice, that is to say, the restoration of the broken unity between theory and practice, the healing of the rift between them. For only in this way can a truly proletarian party armed with revolutionary theory be created. Secondly, the testing of the policy of the parties of the Second International, not by their slogans and resolutions, but by their deeds, by their actions. For only in this way can the confidence of the proletarian masses be won and deserved. Thirdly, the reorganization of all party work on new revolutionary lines, with a view to training and preparing the masses for the revolutionary struggle. For only in this way can the masses be prepared for the proletarian revolution. Fourthly, self-criticism within the proletarian parties, their education and training on the basis of their own mistakes, for only in this way can genuine cadres and genuine leaders of the party be trained. Such is the basis and substance of the method of Leninism. How is this method applied in practice? The opportunists of the Second International have a number of theoretical dogmas to which they always revert as their starting point. Let us take a few of these. First dogma, concerning the conditions for the seizure of power by the proletariat. The opportunists assert that the proletariat cannot and ought not to take power unless it constitutes a majority in the country. No proofs are brought forward, for there are no proofs, either theoretical or practical, that can bear out this absurd thesis. Let us assume that this is so. Lenin replies to the gentlemen of the Second International, but suppose a historical situation has arisen in which the proletariat, constituting a minority of the population, has an opportunity to rally around itself the vast majority of the laboring masses. Why should it not take power then? Why should the proletariat not take advantage of a favorable international and internal situation to pierce the front of capital and hasten the general denouement? Did not Marx say as far back as the 50s of the last century that things could go splendidly with the proletarian revolution in Germany were it possible to back it by, so to speak, a second edition of the Peasants' War? Is it not a generally known fact that in those days the number of proletarians in Germany was relatively smaller than, for example, in Russia in 1917? Has not the practical experience of the Russian proletarian revolution shown that this favorite dogma of the heroes of the Second International is devoid of all vital significance for the proletariat? Is it not clear that the practical experience of the revolutionary struggle of the masses refutes and smashes this obsolete dogma? Second dogma. The proletariat cannot retain power if it lacks an adequate number of trained cultural and administrative cadres capable of organizing the administration of the country. These cadres must first be trained under capitalist conditions, and only then can power be taken. Let us assume that this is so, replies Lenin, but why not turn it this way? First take power, create favorable conditions for the development of the proletariat, and then proceed with seven league strides to raise the cultural level of the laboring masses and train numerous cadres of leaders and administrators from among the workers. Has not Russian experience shown that the cadres of leaders recruited from the ranks of the workers develop a hundred times more rapidly and effectually under the rule of the proletariat than under the rule of capital? Is it not clear that the practical experience of the revolutionary struggle of the masses ruthlessly smashes this theoretical dogma of the opportunists too? Third dogma, the proletariat cannot accept the method of the political general strike because it is unsound in theory and dangerous in practice and cannot serve as a substitute for parliamentary forms of struggle, which are the principal form of the class struggle of the proletariat. Very well, reply the Leninists, but firstly, Ingalls did not criticize every kind of general strike. He only criticized a certain kind of general strike, namely, the economic general strike advocated by the anarchists in place of the political struggle of the proletariat. What has this to do with the method of the political general strike? Secondly, where and by whom has it ever been proved that the parliamentary form of struggle is the principal form of struggle of the proletariat? Does not the history of the revolutionary movement 
show that the parliamentary struggle is only a school for and an auxiliary in organizing the extra-parliamentary struggle of the proletariat, that under capitalism the fundamental problems of the working class movement are solved by force, by the direct struggle of the proletarian masses, their general strike, their uprising. Thirdly, who suggested that the method of the political general strike be substituted for the parliamentary struggle? Where and when have the supporters of the political general strike sought to substitute extra-parliamentary forms of struggle for parliamentary forms? Fourthly, has not the revolution in Russia shown that the political general strike is a highly important school for the proletarian revolution and an indispensable means of mobilizing and organizing the vast masses of the proletariat on the eve of storming the citadels of capitalism? Why then the Philistine lamentations over the disturbance of the normal course of economic life and over the coffers of the trade unions? Is it not clear that the practical experience of the revolutionary struggle smashes this dogma of the opportunists too? And so on and so forth. That is why Lenin said that revolutionary theory is not a dogma, that it assumes final shape only in close connection with the practical activity of a truly mass and truly revolutionary movement. For theory must serve practice, for theory must answer the questions raised by practice, for it must be tested by practical results. As to the political slogans and the political resolutions of the parties of the Second International, it is sufficient to recall the history of the slogan, War Against War, to realize how utterly false and utterly rotten are the political practices of these parties, which use pompous revolutionary slogans and resolutions to cloak their anti-revolutionary deeds. We all remember the pompous demonstration of the Second International at the Basel Congress, at which it threatened the imperialist with all the horrors of insurrection if they should dare to start a war, and with the menacing slogan, War Against War. But who does not remember that sometime after, on the very eve of the war, the Basel Resolution was pigeonholed and the workers were given a new slogan to exterminate each other for the glory of their capitalist fatherlands? Is it not clear that revolutionary slogans and resolutions are not worth a farthing unless backed by deeds? One need only contrast the Leninist policy of transforming the imperialist war into civil war with the treacherous policy of the Second International during the war to understand the utter baseness of the opportunist politicians and the full grandeur of the method of Leninism. I cannot refrain from quoting at this point a passage from Lenin's book, The Proletarian Revolution and the Renegade Kautsky, in which Lenin severely castigates an opportunist attempt by the leader of the Second International, K. Kautsky, to judge parties not by their deeds, but by their paper slogans and documents. Kautsky is pursuing a typically petty bourgeois Philistine policy by pretending that putting forward a slogan alters the position. The entire history of bourgeois democracy refutes this illusion. The bourgeois Democrats have always advanced and still advance all sorts of slogans in order to deceive the people. The point is to test their sincerity, to compare their words with their deeds, not to be satisfied with idealistic or charlatan phrases, but to get down to class reality. There is no need to mention the fear the parties of the Second International have of self-criticism, their habit of concealing their mistakes, of glossing over vexed questions, of covering up their shortcomings by a deceptive show of well-being, which blunts living thought and prevents the party from deriving revolutionary training from its own mistakes, a habit which was ridiculed and pilloried by Lenin. Here is what Lenin wrote about self-criticism in proletarian parties in his pamphlet, Left-Wing Communism. The attitude of a political party towards its own mistakes is one of the most important and surest ways of judging how earnest the party is and how it in practice fulfills its obligations towards its class and the toiling masses. Frankly, admitting a mistake, ascertaining the reasons for it, analyzing the circumstances which gave rise to it, and thoroughly discussing the means of correcting it, that is the earmark of a serious party. That is the way it should perform its duties. That is the way it should educate and train the class and then the masses. Some say that the exposure of its own mistakes and self-criticism are dangerous for the party because they may be used by the enemy against the party of the proletariat. Lenin regarded such objections as trivial and entirely wrong. Here is what he wrote on this subject as far back as 1904 in his pamphlet One Step Forward when our party was still weak and small. They gloat and grimace over our controversies. And of course, they will try to pick isolated passages from my pamphlet, which deals with the defects and shortcomings of our party and to use them for their own ends. The Russian Social Democrats are already steeled enough in battle not to be perturbed by these pinpricks and to continue, in spite of them, their work of self-criticism and ruthless exposure of their own shortcomings, which will unquestionably and inevitably be overcome as the working class movement grows. Such, in general, are the characteristic features of the method of Leninism. What is contained in Lenin's method was in the main already contained in the teachings of Marx, which, according to Marx himself, were, in essence, critical and revolutionary. It is precisely this critical and revolutionary spirit that pervades Lenin's method from beginning to end. But it would be wrong to suppose that Lenin's method is merely the restoration of the method of Marx. As a matter of fact, Lenin's method is not only the restoration, but also the concretization and further development of the critical and revolutionary method of Marx, of his materialist dialectics. Theory 
From this theme, I take three questions. A, the importance of theory for the proletarian movement. B, criticism of the theory of spontaneity. C, the theory of the proletarian revolution. One, the importance of theory. Some think that Leninism is the precedence of practice over theory, in the sense that its main point is the translation of the Marxist theses into deeds, their execution. As for theory, it is alleged that Leninism is rather unconcerned about it. We know that Plekhanov time and again chaffed Lenin about his unconcern for theory, and particularly for philosophy. We also know that theory is not held in great favor by many present-day Leninist practical workers, particularly in view of the immense amount of practical work imposed upon them by the situation. I must declare that this more than odd opinion about Lenin and Leninism is quite wrong and bears no relation whatever to the truth, that the attempt of practical workers to brush theory aside runs counter to the whole spirit of Leninism and is fraught with serious dangers to the work. Theory is the experience of the working class movement in all countries taken in its general aspect. Of course, theory becomes purposeless if it is not connected with revolutionary practice, just as practice gropes in the dark if its path is not illumined by revolutionary theory. But theory can become a tremendous force in the working class movement if it is built up in indissoluble connection with revolutionary practice. For theory and theory alone can give the movement confidence, the power of orientation, and an understanding of the inner relation of surrounding events. For it, and it alone, can help practice to realize not only how and in which direction classes are moving at the present time, but also how and in which direction they will move in the near future. None other than Lenin uttered and repeated scores of times the well-known thesis that, without a revolutionary theory, there can be no Revolu 19. Lenin, better than anyone else, understood the great importance of theory, particularly for a party such as ours, in view of the role of vanguard fighter of the international proletariat, which has fallen to its lot, and in view of the complicated internal and international situation in which it finds itself. Foreseeing this special role of our party as far back as 1902, he thought it necessary even then to point out that the role of vanguard fighter can be fulfilled only by a party that is guided by the most advanced theory. It scarcely needs proof that now, when Lenin's prediction about the role of our party has come true, this thesis of Lenin's acquires special force and special importance. Perhaps the most striking expression of the great importance which Lenin attached to theory is the fact that none other than Lenin undertook the very serious task of generalizing on the basis of materialist philosophy, the most important achievements of science from the time of Engels down to his own time, as well as of subjecting to comprehensive criticism the anti-materialistic trends among Marxists. Engels said that materialism has to change its form with each epoch-making discovery. It is well known that none other than Lenin accomplished this task for his own time in his remarkable work, Materialism and Imperial Criticism. It is well known that Plekhanov, who loved to chaff Lenin about his unconcern for philosophy, did not even dare to make a serious attempt to undertake such a task. 2. Criticism of the theory of spontaneity, or the role of the vanguard in the movement. The theory of spontaneity is a theory of opportunism, a theory of worshipping the spontaneity of the labor movement, a theory which actually repudiates the leading role of the vanguard of the working class, of the party of the working class. The theory of worshipping spontaneity is decidedly opposed to the revolutionary character of the working class movement. It is opposed to the movement taking the line of struggle against the foundations of capitalism, it is in favor of the movement proceeding exclusively along the line of realizable demands, of demands acceptable to capitalism. It is wholly in favor of the line of least resistance. The theory of spontaneity is the ideology of trade unionism. The theory of worshiping spontaneity is decidedly opposed to giving the spontaneous movement a politically conscious, planned character. It is opposed to the party marching at the head of the working class, to the party raising the masses to the level of political consciousness, to the party leading the movement, it is in favor of the politically conscious elements of the movement, not hindering the movement from taking its own course. It is in favor of the party, only heeding the spontaneous movement and dragging at the tail of it. The theory of spontaneity is the theory of belittling the role of the conscious element in the movement, the ideology of kvostism, the logical basis of all opportunism. In practice, this theory, which appeared on the scene even before the first revolution in Russia, led its adherents, the so-called economists, to deny the need for an independent workers' party in Russia, to oppose the revolutionary struggle of the working class for the overthrow of czarism, to preach a purely trade unionist policy in the movement, and in general, to surrender the labor movement to the hegemony of the liberal bourgeoisie. The fight of the old Iskra and the brilliant criticism of the theory of Hvostism in Lenin's pamphlet What is to be Done not only smashed so-called economism, but also created the theoretical foundations for a truly revolutionary movement of the Russian working class. Without this fight, it would have been quite useless even to think of creating an independent workers' party in Russia and of its playing a leading part in the revolution. Out exception, I have in mind the so-called productive forces theory as debased by the leaders of the Second International, which justifies everything and conciliates everybody, which records facts and explains them after everyone has become sick and tired of them, and having recorded them, rests content. 
Marx said that the materialist theory could not confine itself to explaining the world, that it must also change it. But Kautsky and co. are not concerned with this. They prefer to rest content with the first part of Marx's formula. Here is one of the numerous examples of the application of this theory. It is said that before the imperialist war, the parties of the Second International threatened to declare war against war if the imperialists should start a war. It is said that on the very eve of the war, these parties pigeonholed the war against war slogan and applied an opposite one, viz. war for the imperialist fatherland. It is said that as a result of this change of slogans, millions of workers were sent to their death. But it would be a mistake to think that there were some people to blame for this, that someone was unfaithful to the working class or betrayed it. Not at all. Everything happened as it should have happened. Firstly, because the international, it seems, is an instrument of peace and not of war. Secondly, because in view of the level of the productive forces which then prevailed, nothing else could be done. The productive forces are to blame. That is the precise explanation vouchsafed to us by Mr. Kotsky's theory of the productive forces. And whoever does not believe in that theory is not a Marxist. The role of the parties, their importance for the movement. But what can a party do against so decisive a factor as the level of the productive forces? One could cite a host of similar examples of the falsification of Marxism. Vacation is a preliminary condition for the creation of truly revolutionary parties in the West. Three, the theory of the proletarian revolution. Lenin's theory of the proletarian revolution proceeds from three fundamental theses. First thesis, the domination of finance capital in the advanced capitalist countries, the issue of stocks and bonds as one of the principal operations of finance capital, the export of capital to the sources of raw materials, which is one of the foundations of imperialism, the omnipotence of a financial oligarchy, which is the result of the domination of finance capital, all this reveals the grossly parasitic character of monopolist capitalism, makes the yoke of the capitalist trusts and syndicates a hundred times more burdensome, intensifies the indignation of the working class with the foundations of capitalism, and brings the masses to the proletarian revolution as their only salvation. Hence the first conclusion, intensification of the revolutionary crisis within the capitalist countries and growth of the elements of an explosion on the internal proletarian front in the metropolises. Second thesis, the increase in the export of capital to the colonies and dependent countries, the expansion of spheres of influence and colonial possessions until they cover the whole globe, the transformation of capitalism into a world system of financial enslavement and colonial oppression of the vast majority of the population of the world by a handful of advanced countries. All this has, on the one hand, converted the separate national economies and national territories into links in a single chain called world economy, and on the other hand, split the population of the globe into two camps, a handful of advanced capitalist countries which exploit and oppress vast colonies and dependencies, and the huge majority consisting of colonial and dependent countries, which are compelled to wage a struggle for liberation from the imperialist yoke. Hence the second conclusion, intensification of the revolutionary crisis in the colonial countries and growth of the elements of revolt against imperialism on the external colonial front. Third thesis, the monopolistic possession of spheres of influence and colonies, the uneven development of the capitalist countries, leading to a frenzied struggle for the redivision of the world between the countries which have already seized territories and those claiming their share imperialist wars as the only means of restoring the disturbed equilibrium. All this leads to the intensification of the struggle on the third front, the intercapitalist front, which weakens imperialism and facilitates the union of the first two fronts against imperialism, the front of the revolutionary proletariat and the front of colonial emancipation. Hence the third conclusion, that under imperialism wars cannot be averted, and that a coalition between the proletarian revolution in Europe and the colonial revolution in the East, in a united world front of revolution against the world front of imperialism, is inevitable. Lenin combines all these conclusions into one general conclusion, that imperialism is the eve of the socialist revolution. The very approach to the question of the proletarian revolution, of the character of the revolution, of its scope, of its depth, the scheme of the revolution in general, changes accordingly. Formerly, the analysis of the prerequisites for the proletarian revolution was usually approached from the point of view of the economic state of individual countries. Now, this approach is no longer adequate. Now the matter must be approached from the point of view of the economic state of all, or the majority of countries, from the point of view of the state of world economy. For individual countries and individual national economies have ceased to be self-sufficient units, have become links in a single chain called world economy. For the old, cultured capitalism has evolved into imperialism, and imperialism is a world system of financial enslavement and colonial oppression of the vast majority of the population of the world by a handful of advanced countries. Formerly, it was the accepted thing to speak of the existence or absence of objective conditions for the proletarian revolution in individual countries, or, to be more precise, in one or another developed country. Now this point of view is no longer adequate. Now we must speak of the existence of objective conditions for the revolution in the entire system of the world imperialist economy as an integral whole. 
the existence within this system of some countries that are not sufficiently developed industrially cannot serve as an insuperable obstacle to the revolution if the system as a whole, or, more correctly, because the system as a whole is already ripe for revolution. Formerly, it was the accepted thing to speak of the proletarian revolution in one or another developed country as of a separate and self-sufficient entity opposing a separate national front of capital as its antipode. Now, this point of view is no longer adequate. Now we must speak of the world proletarian revolution, for the separate national fronts of capital have become links in a single chain called the world front of imperialism, which must be opposed by a common front of the revolutionary movement in all countries. Formerly, the proletarian revolution was regarded exclusively as the result of the internal development of a given country. Now, this point of view is no longer adequate. Now, the proletarian revolution must be regarded primarily as the result of the development of the contradictions within the world system of imperialism, as the result of the breaking of the chain of the world imperialist front in one country or another. Where will the revolution begin? Where in what country can the front of capital be pierced first? Where industry is more developed, where the proletariat constitutes the majority, where there is more culture, where there is more democracy? That was the reply usually given formerly. No, objects the Leninist theory of revolution, not necessarily where industry is more developed and so forth. The front of capital will be pierced where the chain of imperialism is weakest, for the proletarian revolution is the result of the breaking of the chain of the world imperialist front at its weakest link. And it may turn out that the country which has started the revolution, which has made a breach in the front of capital, is less developed in a capitalist sense than other, more developed countries, which have, however, remained within the framework of capitalism. In 1917, the chain of the imperialist world front proved to be weaker in Russia than in the other countries. It was there that the chain broke and provided an outlet for the proletarian revolution. Why? because in Russia a great popular revolution was unfolding, and at its head marched the revolutionary proletariat, which had such an important ally as the vast mass of the peasantry, which was oppressed and exploited by the landlords. Because the revolution there was opposed by such a hideous representative of imperialism as Tsarism, which lacked all moral prestige and was deservedly hated by the whole population. The chain proved to be weaker in Russia, although Russia was less developed in a capitalist sense than, say, France or Germany, Britain or America. Where will the chain break in the near future? Again, where it is weakest? It is not precluded that the chain may break, say, in India. Why? Because that country has a young militant revolutionary proletariat, which has such an ally as the National Liberation Movement, an undoubtedly powerful and undoubtedly important ally. Because there the revolution is confronted by such a well-known foe as foreign imperialism, which has no moral credit and is deservedly hated by all the oppressed and exploited masses of India. It is also quite possible that the chain will break in Germany. Why? Because the factors which are operating, say, in India are beginning to operate in Germany as well. But of course, the enormous difference in the level of development between India and Germany cannot but stamp its imprint on the progress and outcome of a revolution in Germany. That is why Lenin said that the West European capitalist countries will consummate their development towards socialism, not by the even maturing of socialism in them, but by the exploitation of some countries by others, by the exploitation of the first of the countries to be vanquished in the imperialist war, combined with the exploitation of the whole of the East. On the other hand, precisely as a result of the first imperialist war, the East has definitely come into revolutionary movement, has been definitely drawn into the general maelstrom of the world revolutionary movement. Briefly, the chain of the imperialist front must as a rule break where the links are weaker, and at all events, not necessarily where capitalism is more developed, where there is such and such a percentage of proletarians, and such and such a percentage of peasants, and so on. That is why, in deciding the question of proletarian revolution, statistical estimates of the percentage of the proletarian population in a given country lose the exceptional importance so eagerly attached to them by the doctrinaires of the Second International, who have not understood imperialism and who fear revolution like the plague. To proceed, the heroes of the Second International asserted that between the bourgeois democratic revolution and the proletarian revolution, there is a chasm, or at any rate a Chinese wall, separating one from the other by a more or less protracted interval of time, during which the bourgeoisie having come into power develops capitalism while the proletariat accumulates strength and prepares for the decisive struggle against capitalism. This interval is usually calculated to extend over many decades, if not longer. It scarcely needs proof that this Chinese wall theory is totally devoid of scientific meaning under the conditions of imperialism, that it is and can be only a means of concealing and camouflaging the counter-revolutionary aspirations of the bourgeoisie. It scarcely needs proof that under the conditions of imperialism, fraught as it is with collisions and wars, under the conditions of the eve of the socialist revolution, when flourishing capitalism becomes moribund, capitalism and the revolutionary movement is growing in all countries of the world, when imperialism is allying itself with all reactionary forces without exception, down to and including czarism and serfdom, thus making imperative the coalition of all revolutionary forces, from the proletarian movement of the West to the national liberation movement of the East, 
when the overthrow of the survivals of the regime of feudal serfdom becomes impossible without a revolutionary struggle against imperialism, it scarcely needs proof that the bourgeois democratic revolution, in a more or less developed country, must under such circumstances verge upon the proletarian revolution that the former must pass into the latter. The history of the revolution in Russia has provided palpable proof that this thesis is correct and incontrovertible. It was not without reason that Lenin, as far back as 1905, on the eve of the first Russian revolution, in his pamphlet Two Tactics, depicted the bourgeois democratic revolution and the socialist revolution as two links in the same chain, as a single and integral picture of the sweep of the Russian revolution the proletariat must carry to completion the democratic revolution by allying to itself the mass of the peasantry in order to crush by force the resistance of the autocracy and to paralyze the instability of the bourgeoisie. The proletariat must accomplish the socialist revolution by allying to itself the mass of the semi-proletarian elements of the population in order to crush by force the resistance of the bourgeoisie and to paralyze the instability of the peasantry and the petty bourgeoisie. Such are the tasks of the proletariat, which the new Iskraists present so narrowly in all their arguments and resolutions about the sweep of the revolution. There is no need to mention other, later works of Lenin's, in which the idea of the bourgeois revolution passing into the proletarian revolution stands out in greater relief than in two tactics as one of the cornerstones of the Leninist theory of revolution. Some comrades believe it seems that Lenin arrived at this idea only in 1916, that up to that time he had thought that the revolution in Russia would remain within the bourgeois framework, that power, consequently, would pass from the hands of the organ of the dictatorship of the proletariat and peasantry into the hands of the bourgeoisie and not of the proletariat. It is said that this assertion has even penetrated into our communist press. I must say that this assertion is absolutely wrong, that it is totally at variance with the facts. I might refer to Lenin's well-known speech at the Third Congress of the Party, in which he defined the dictatorship of the proletariat and peasantry, i.e. the victory of the democratic revolution, not as the organization of order, but as the organization of war. Further, I might refer to Lenin's well-known articles on a provisional government, where outlining the prospects of the bet unfolding Russian revolution, he assigns to the party the task of ensuring that the Russian revolution is not a movement of a few months, but a movement of many years, that it leads not merely to slight concessions on the part of the powers that be, but to the complete overthrow of those powers. Where, enlarging further on these prospects and linking them with the revolution in Europe, he goes on to say, and if we succeed in doing that, then, then the revolutionary conflagration will spread all over Europe. The European worker, languishing under bourgeois reaction, will rise in his turn and will show us how it is done. Then the revolutionary wave in Europe will sweep back again into Russia and will convert an epoch of a few revolutionary years into an epoch of several revolutionary decades. I might further refer to a well-known article by Lenin published in November 1915, in which he writes, The proletariat is fighting and will fight valiantly to capture power for a republic for the confiscation of the land for the participation of the non-proletarian masses of the people in liberating bourgeois Russia from military feudal imperialism. And the proletariat will immediately take advantage of this liberation of bourgeois Russia from czarism, from the agrarian power of the landlords, not to aid the rich peasants in their struggle against the rural worker, but to bring about the socialist revolution in alliance with the proletarians of Europe. Finally, I might refer to the well-known passage in Lenin's pamphlet, The Proletarian Revolution and the Renegade Kautsky, where, referring to the above-quoted passage in two tactics on the sweep of the Russian Revolution, he arrives at the following conclusion. Things turned out just as we said they would. The course taken by the revolution confirmed the correctness of our reasoning. First, with the whole of the peasantry against the monarchy, against the landlords, against the medieval regime. Then, with the poor peasants, with the semi-proletarians, with all the exploited, against capitalism, including the rural rich, the kulaks, the profiteers, and to that extent the revolution becomes a socialist one. To attempt to raise an artificial Chinese wall between the first and second, to separate them by anything else than the degree of preparedness of the proletariat and the degree of its unity with the poor peasants, means monstrously to distort Marxism, to vulgarize it, to replace it by liberalism. That is sufficient, I think. Very well, we may be told, but if that is the case, why did Lenin combat the idea of permanent revolution? Because Lenin proposed that the revolutionary capacities of the peasantry be exhausted and that the fullest use be made of their revolutionary energy for the complete liquidation of czarism and for the transition to the proletarian revolution, whereas the adherents of permanent revolution did not understand the important role of the peasantry in the Russian revolution, underestimated the strength of the revolutionary energy of the peasantry, underestimated the strength and ability of the Russian proletariat to lead the peasantry, and thereby hampered the work of emancipating the peasantry from the influence of the bourgeoisie, the work of rallying the peasantry around the proletariat. Because Lenin proposed that the revolution be crowned with the transfer of power to the proletariat, whereas the adherents of permanent revolution wanted to begin at once with the establishment of the power of the proletariat, 
failing to realize that in so doing they were closing their eyes to such a minor detail as the survivals of serfdom and were leaving out of account so important a force as the Russian peasantry. Failing to understand that such a policy could only retard the winning of the peasantry over to the side of the proletariat. Consequently, Lenin fought the adherence of permanent revolution, not over the question of uninterruptedness. For Lenin himself maintained the point of view of uninterrupted revolution, but because they underestimated the role of the peasantry, which is an enormous reserve of the proletariat, because they failed to understand the idea of the hegemony of the proletariat, the idea of permanent revolution should not be regarded as a new idea. It was first advanced by Marx at the end of the 40s in his well-known address to the Communist League. It is from this document that our permanentists took the idea of uninterrupted revolution. It should be noted that in taking it from Marx, our permanentists altered it somewhat, and in altering it, spoilt it and made it unfit for practical use. The experienced hand of Lenin was needed to rectify this mistake, to take Marx's idea of uninterrupted revolution in its pure form and make it a cornerstone of his theory of revolution. Here is what Marx says in his address about uninterrupted revolution, after enumerating a number of revolutionary democratic demands, which he calls upon the communists to win. While the democratic petty bourgeois wish to bring the revolution to a conclusion as quickly as possible, and with the achievement at most of the above demands, it is our interest and our task to make the revolution permanent, until all more or less possessing classes have been forced out of their position of dominance, until the proletariat has conquered state power, and the association of proletarians, not only in one country, but in all the dominant countries of the world, has advanced so far that competition among the proletarians of these countries has ceased and that at least the decisive productive forces are concentrated in the hands of the proletarians. In other words, A, Marx did not at all propose to begin the revolution in the Germany of the 50s with the immediate establishment of proletarian power, contrary to the plans of our Russian permanentists. B, Marx proposed only that the revolution be crowned with the establishment of proletarian state power by hurling, step by step, one section of the bourgeoisie after another from the heights of power, in order, after the attainment of power by the proletariat, to kindle the fire of revolution in every country, and everything that Lenin taught and carried out in the course of our revolution in pursuit of his theory of the proletarian revolution under the conditions of imperialism was fully in line with that proposition. It follows, then, that our Russian permanentists have not only underestimated the role of the peasantry in the Russian revolution and the importance of the idea of the hegemony of the proletariat, but have altered Marx's idea of permanent revolution and made it unfit for practical use. That is why Lenin ridiculed the theory of our permanentists, calling it original and fine, and accusing them of refusing to think why, for ten whole years, life has passed by this fine theory. That is why Lenin regarded this theory as a semi-Menshevik theory, and said that it borrows from the Bolsheviks their call for a resolute revolutionary struggle by the proletariat and the conquest of political power by the latter, and from the Mensheviks the repudiation of the role of the peasantry. This, then, is the position in regard to Lenin's idea of the bourgeois democratic revolution passing into the proletarian revolution, of utilizing the bourgeois revolution for the immediate transition to the proletarian revolution. To proceed, formerly, the victory of the revolution in one country was considered impossible on the assumption that it would require the combined action of the proletarians of all or at least of a majority of the advanced countries to achieve victory over the bourgeoisie. Now, this point of view no longer fits in with the facts. Now we must proceed from the possibility of such a victory for the uneven and spasmodic character of the development of the various capitalist countries under the conditions of imperialism, the development within imperialism of catastrophic contradictions leading to inevitable wars, the growth of the revolutionary movement in all countries of the world, all this leads not only to the possibility, but also to the necessity of the victory of the proletariat in individual countries. The history of the revolution in Russia is direct proof of this. At the same time, however, it must be borne in mind that the overthrow of the bourgeoisie can be successfully accomplished only when certain absolutely necessary conditions exist, in the absence of which there can be even no question of the proletariat taking power. Here is what Lenin says about these conditions in his pamphlet, Left-Wing Communism. The fundamental law of revolution, which has been confirmed by all revolutions, and particularly by all three Russian revolutions in the 20th century, is as follows. It is not enough for revolution that the exploited and oppressed masses should understand the impossibility of living in the old way and demand changes. It is essential for revolution that the exploiters should not be able to live and rule in the old way. Only when the lower classes do not want the old way, and when the upper classes cannot carry on in the old way, only then can revolution triumph. This truth may be expressed in other words. Revolution is impossible without a nationwide crisis. It follows that for revolution it is essential, first, that a majority of the workers should fully understand that revolution is necessary and be ready to sacrifice their lives for it. Secondly, that the ruling classes should be passing through a governmental crisis, which draws even the most backward masses into politics, weakens the government, and makes it possible for the revolutionaries to overthrow it rapidly. 
but the overthrow of the power of the bourgeoisie and establishment of the power of the proletariat in one country does not yet mean that the complete victory of socialism has been ensured. After consolidating its power and leading the peasantry in its wake, the proletariat of the victorious country can and must build a socialist society. But does this mean that it will thereby achieve the complete and final victory of socialism, i.e., does it mean that with the forces of only one country it can finally consolidate socialism and fully guarantee that country against intervention and consequently also against restoration? No, it does not. For this, the victory of the revolution in at least several countries is needed. Therefore, the development and support of revolution in other countries is an essential task of the victorious revolution. Therefore, the revolution which has been victorious in one country must regard itself not as a self-sufficient entity, but as an aid, as a means for hastening the victory of the proletariat in other countries. Lenin expressed this thought succinctly when he said that the task of the victorious revolution is to do the utmost possible in one country for the development, support, and awakening of the revolution in all countries. These, in general, are the characteristic features of Lenin's theory of proletarian revolution, the dictatorship of the proletariat. From this theme, I take three fundamental questions. A, the dictatorship of the proletariat as the instrument of the proletarian revolution. B, the dictatorship of the proletariat as the rule of the proletariat over the bourgeoisie. C, Soviet power as the state form of the dictatorship of the proletariat. 1. The dictatorship of the proletariat as the instrument of the proletarian revolution. The question of the proletarian dictatorship is above all a question of the main content of the proletarian revolution. The proletarian revolution, its movement, its sweep, and its achievements acquire flesh and blood only through the dictatorship of the proletariat. The dictatorship of the proletariat is the instrument of the proletarian revolution, its organ, its most important mainstay, brought into being for the purpose of, firstly, crushing the resistance of the overthrown exploiters and consolidating the achievements of the proletarian revolution, and, secondly, carrying the proletarian revolution to its completion, carrying the revolution to the complete victory of socialism. The revolution can defeat the bourgeoisie, can overthrow its power, even without the dictatorship of the proletariat. But the revolution will be unable to crush the resistance of the bourgeoisie, to maintain its victory, and to push forward to the final victory of socialism, unless, at a certain stage in its development, it creates a special organ in the form of the dictatorship of the proletariat as its principal mainstay. The fundamental question of every revolution is the question of power. Does this mean that all that is required is to assume power to seize it? No, it does not. The seizure of power is only the beginning. For many reasons, the bourgeoisie that is overthrown in one country remains for a long time stronger than the proletariat which has overthrown it. Therefore, the whole point is to retain power, to consolidate it, to make it invincible. What is needed to attain this? To attain this, it is necessary to carry out at least three main tasks that confront the dictatorship of the pat, proletariat on the morrow of victory. A, to break the resistance of the landlords and capitalists who have been overthrown and expropriated by the revolution, to liquidate every attempt on their part to restore the power of capital. B, to organize construction in such a way as to rally all the working people around the proletariat and to carry on this work along the lines of preparing for the elimination, the abolition of classes. C, to arm the revolution, to organize the army of the revolution for the struggle against foreign enemies for the struggle against imperialism. The dictatorship of the proletariat is needed to carry out, to fulfill these tasks. The transition from capitalism to communism, says Lenin, represents an entire historical epoch. Until this epoch has terminated, the exploiters inevitably cherish the hope of restoration, and this hope is converted into attempts at restoration. And after their first serious defeat, the overthrown exploiters, who had not expected their overthrow, never believed it possible, never conceded the thought of it, throw themselves with energy grown tenfold, with furious passion and hatred grown a hundredfold, into the battle for the recovery of the paradise of which they have been deprived on behalf of their families, who had been leading such a sweet and easy life, and whom now the common herd is condemning to ruin and destitution. In the train of the capitalist exploiters follow the broad masses of the petty bourgeoisie, with regard to whom decades of historical experience of all countries testify that they vacillate and hesitate, one day marching behind the proletariat and the next day taking fright at the difficulties of the revolution that they become panic-stricken at the first defeat or semi-defeat of the workers, grow nervous, rush about, snivel, and run from one camp into the other. The bourgeoisie has its grounds for making attempts at restoration, because for a long time after its overthrow, it remains stronger than the, if the exploiters are defeated in one country only, says Lenin, and this, of course, is the typical case, since a simultaneous revolution in a number of countries is a rare exception, they still remain stronger than the exploited. Wherein lies the strength of the overthrown bourgeoisie? Firstly, in the strength of international capital, in the strength and durability of the international connections of the bourgeoisie. Secondly, in the fact that, for a long time after the revolution, the exploiters inevitably retain a number of great practical advantages. They still have money, some movable property, often fairly considerable. They still have various connections, habits of organization and management, knowledge of all the secrets of management, 
superior education, close connections with the higher technical personnel, incomparably greater experience in the art of war, and so on and so forth. Thirdly, in the force of habit, in the strength of small production, for unfortunately, small production is still very, very widespread in the world, and small production engenders capitalism and the bourgeoisie continuously, daily, hourly, spontaneously, and on a mass scale. For the abolition of classes means not only driving out the landlords and capitalists that we accomplish with comparative ease, it also means abolishing the small commodity producers, and they cannot be driven out or crushed. We must live in harmony with them. They can be remolded and re-educated only by very prolonged, slow, cautious organizational work. The dictatorship of the proletariat is a most determined and most ruthless war waged by the new class against a more powerful enemy, the bourgeoisie, whose resistance is increased tenfold by its overthrow. And that, the dictatorship of the proletariat is a stubborn struggle, bloody and bloodless, violent and peaceful, military and economic, educational and administrative, against the forces and traditions of the old society. It scarcely needs proof that there is not the slightest possibility of carrying out these tasks in a short period, of accomplishing all this in a few years. Therefore, the dictatorship of the proletariat, the transition from capitalism to communism, must not be regarded as a fleeting period of super-revolutionary acts and decrees, but as an entire historical era, replete with civil wars and external conflicts, with persistent organizational work and economic construction, with advances and retreats, victories and defeats. This historical era is needed not only to create the economic and cultural prerequisites for the complete victory of socialism, but also to enable the proletariat, firstly, to educate itself and become steeled as a force capable of governing the country, and, secondly, to re-educate and remold the petty bourgeois strata along such lines as will assure the organization of socialist production. You will have to go through 15, 20, 50 years of civil wars and international conflicts, Marx said to the workers, not only to change existing conditions, but also to change yourselves and to make yourselves capable of wielding political power. Continuing and developing Marx's idea still further, Lenin wrote that, it will be necessary under the dictatorship of the proletariat to re-educate millions of peasants and small proprietors, hundreds of thousands of office employees, officials and bourgeois intellectuals, to subordinate them all to the proletarian state and to proletarian leadership, to overcome their bourgeois habits and traditions. Just as we must, in a protracted struggle waged on the basis of the dictatorship of the proletariat, re-educate the proletarians themselves, who do not abandon their petty bourgeois prejudices at one stroke, by a miracle, at the bidding of the Virgin Mary, at the bidding of a slogan, resolution, or decree, but only in the course of a long and difficult mass struggle against mass petty bourgeois influences. Two, the dictatorship of the proletariat as the rule of the proletariat over the bourgeoisie. From the foregoing, it is evident that the dictatorship of the proletariat is not a mere change of personalities in the government, a change of the cabinet, etc., leaving the old economic and political order intact. The Mensheviks and opportunists of all countries, who fear dictatorship like fire, and in their fright substitute the concept conquest of power, for the concept of dictatorship, usually reduce the conquest of power to a change of the cabinet, to the accession to power of a new ministry made up of people like Scheidemann and Noska, MacDonald and Henderson. It is hardly necessary to explain that these and similar cabinet changes have nothing in common with the dictatorship of the proletariat, with the conquest of real power by the real proletariat. With the MacDonalds and Scheidemanns in power, while the old bourgeois order is allowed to remain, their so-called governments cannot be anything else than an apparatus serving the bourgeoisie a screen to conceal the ulcers of imperialism, a weapon in the hands of the bourgeoisie against the revolutionary movement of the oppressed and exploited masses. Capital needs such governments as a screen when it finds it inconvenient, unprofitable, difficult to oppress and exploit the masses without the aid of a screen. Of course, the appearance of such governments is a symptom that over there all is not quiet at the Shipka Pass. Nevertheless, governments of this kind inevitably remain governments of capital in disguise. The government of a MacDonald or a Scheidman is as far removed from the conquest of power by the proletariat as the sky from the earth. The dictatorship of the proletariat is not a change of government, but a new state with new organs of power, both central and local. It is the state of the proletariat, which has arisen on the ruins of the old state, the state of the bourgeoisie. The dictatorship of the proletariat arises not on the basis of the bourgeois order, but in the process of the breaking up of this order, after the overthrow of the bourgeoisie, in the process of the expropriation of the landlords and capitalists, in the process of the socialization of the principal instruments and means of production, in the process of violent proletarian revolution. The dictatorship of the proletariat is a revolutionary power based on the use of force against the bourgeoisie. The state is a machine in the hands of the ruling class for suppressing the resistance of its class enemies. In this respect, the dictatorship of the proletariat does not differ essentially from the dictatorship of any other class, for the proletarian state is a machine for the suppression of the bourgeoisie. But there is one substantial difference. This difference consists in the fact that all hitherto existing class states have been dictatorships of an exploiting minority over the exploited majority. 
whereas the dictatorship of the proletariat is the dictatorship of the exploited majority over the exploiting minority. Briefly, the dictatorship of the proletariat is the rule, unrestricted by law and based on force, of the proletariat over the bourgeoisie, a rule enjoying the sympathy and support of the laboring and exploited masses. From this, follow two main conclusions. First conclusion, the dictatorship of the proletariat cannot be complete democracy, democracy for all, for the rich as well as for the poor. The dictatorship of the proletariat must be a state that is democratic in a new way and dictatorial in a new way. The talk of Kautsky and Co about universal equality, about pure democracy, about perfect democracy and the like, is a bourgeois disguise of the indubitable fact that equality between exploited and exploiters is impossible. The theory of pure democracy is the theory of the upper stratum of the working class, which has been broken in and is being fed by the imperialist robbers. It was brought into being for the purpose of concealing the ulcers of capitalism, of embellishing imperialism, and lending it moral strength in the struggle against the exploited masses. Under capitalism, there are no real liberties for the exploited, nor can there be, if for no other reason than that the premises, printing plants, paper supplies, etc., indispensable for the enjoyment of liberties, are the privilege of the exploiters. Under capitalism, the exploited masses do not, nor can they ever, really participate in governing the country, if for no other reason than that, even under the most democratic regime, under conditions of capitalism, governments are not set up by the people, but by the Rothschilds and Stimises, the Rockefellers and Morgans. Democracy under capitalism is capitalist democracy, the democracy of the exploiting minority, based on the restriction of the rights of the exploited majority and directed against this majority. Only under the proletarian dictatorship are real liberties for the exploited and real participation of the proletarians and peasants in governing the country possible. Under the dictatorship of the proletariat, democracy is proletarian democracy, the democracy of the exploited majority, based on the restriction of the rights of the exploiting minority and directed against this minority. Second conclusion. The dictatorship of the proletariat cannot arise as the result of the peaceful development of bourgeois society and of bourgeois democracy. It can arise only as the result of the smashing of the bourgeois state machine, the bourgeois army, the bourgeois bureaucratic apparatus, the bourgeois police. The working class cannot simply lay hold of the ready-made state machinery and wield it for its own purposes, say, Marx and Engels in a preface to the Communist Manifesto. The task of the proletarian revolution is, no longer, as before, to transfer the bureaucratic military machine from one hand to another, but to smash it. This is the preliminary condition for every real people's revolution on the continent, says Marx in his letter to Kugelmann in 1871. Marx's qualifying phrase about the continent gave the opportunists and Mensheviks of all countries a pretext for clamoring that Marx thus conceded the possibility of the peaceful evolution of bourgeois democracy into a proletarian democracy, at least in certain countries outside the European continent. Marx did in fact concede that possibility, and he had good grounds for conceding it in regard to Britain and America in the 70s of the last century when monopoly capitalism and imperialism did not yet exist, and when these countries, owing to the particular conditions of their development, had as yet no developed militarism and bureaucracy. That was the situation before the appearance of developed imperialism. But later, after a lapse of 30 or 40 years, when the situation in these countries had radically changed, when imperialism had developed and had embraced all capitalist countries without exception, when militarism and bureaucracy had appeared in Britain and America also, when the particular conditions for peaceful development in Britain and America had disappeared, then the qualification in regard to these countries necessarily could no longer hold good. Today, said Lenin, in 1917, in the epoch of the First Great Imperialist War, this qualification made by Marx is no longer valid. Both Britain and America, the biggest and the last representatives in the whole world of Anglo-Saxon liberty, in the sense that they had no militarism and bureaucracy, have completely sunk into the all-European filthy, bloody morass of bureaucratic military institutions which subordinate everything to themselves and trample everything underfoot. Today, in Britain and in America too, the preliminary condition for every real people's revolution is the smashing, the destruction of the ready-made state machinery. In other words, the law of violent proletarian revolution, the law of the smashing of the bourgeois state machine as a preliminary condition for such a revolution, is an inevitable law of the revolutionary movement in the imperialist countries of the world. Of course, in the remote future, if the proletariat is victorious in the principal capitalist countries, and if the present capitalist encirclement is replaced by a socialist encirclement, a peaceful path of development is quite possible for certain capitalist countries, whose capitalists, in view of the unfavorable international situation, will consider it expedient voluntarily to make substantial concessions to the proletariat. But this supposition applies only to a remote and possible future. With regard to the immediate future, there is no ground whatsoever for this supposition. Therefore, Lenin is right in saying, the proletarian revolution is impossible without the forcible destruction of the bourgeois state machine and the substitution for it of a new one. Three. Soviet power as the state form of the dictatorship of the proletariat. The victory of the dictatorship of the proletariat signifies the suppression of the bourgeoisie, the smashing of the bourgeois state machine, 
and the substitution of proletarian democracy for bourgeois democracy. That is clear. But by means of what organizations can this colossal work be carried out? The old forms of organization of the proletariat, which grew up on the basis of bourgeois parliamentarism, are inadequate for this work, of that there can hardly be any doubt. What, then, are the new forms of organization of the proletariat that are capable of serving as the grave diggers of the bourgeois state machine? That are capable not only of smashing this machine, not only of substituting proletarian democracy for bourgeois democracy, but also of becoming the foundation of the proletarian state power. This new form of organization of the proletariat is the Soviets, wherein lies the strength of the Soviets as compared with the old forms of organization. In that the Soviets are the most all-embracing mass organizations of the proletariat, for they and they alone embrace all workers without exception. In that the Soviets are the only mass organizations which unite all the oppressed and exploited, workers and peasants, soldiers and sailors, and in which the vanguard of the masses, the proletariat, can, for this reason, most easily and most completely exercise its political leadership of the mass struggle. In that the Soviets are the most powerful organs of the revolutionary struggle of the masses, of the political actions of the masses, of the uprising of the masses, organs capable of breaking the omnipotence of finance capital and its political appendages. In that, the Soviets are the immediate organizations of the masses themselves, i.e., they are the most democratic and therefore the most authoritative organizations of the masses, which facilitate to the utmost their participation in the work of building up the new state and in its administration, and which bring into full play the revolutionary energy, initiative, and creative abilities of the masses in the struggle for the destruction of the old order, in the struggle for the new proletarian order. Soviet power is the union and constitution of the local Soviets into one common state organization, into the state organization of the proletariat as the vanguard of the oppressed and exploited masses, and as the ruling class, their union in the Republic of Soviets. The essence of Soviet power consists in the fact that these most all-embracing and most revolutionary mass organizations of precisely those classes that were oppressed by the capitalists and landlords are now the permanent and sole basis of the whole power of the state, of the whole state apparatus that precisely those masses which even in the most democratic bourgeois republics, while being equal in law, have in fact been prevented by thousands of tricks and devices from taking part in political life and from enjoying democratic rights and liberties, are now drawn, unfailingly, into constant, and moreover, decisive participation in the democratic administration of the state. That is why Soviet power is a new form of state organization, different in principle from the old bourgeois democratic and parliamentary form, a new type of state, adapted not to the task of exploiting and oppressing the laboring masses, but to the task of completely emancipating them from all oppression and exploitation, to the tasks facing the dictatorship of the proletariat. Lenin is right in saying that with the appearance of Soviet power, the era of bourgeois democratic parliamentarism has drawn to a close and a new chapter in world history, the era of proletarian dictatorship, has been opened. Wherein lie the characteristic features of Soviet power? In that Soviet power is the most all-embracing and most democratic state organization of all possible state organizations, while classes continue to exist, for being the arena of the bond and collaboration between the workers and the exploited peasants in their struggle against the exploiters, and basing itself in its work on this bond and on this collaboration, Soviet power is thus the power of the majority of the population over the minority. It is the state of the majority, the expression of its dictatorship. In that Soviet power is the most internationalist of all state organizations in class society. For, by destroying every kind of national oppression and resting on the collaboration of the laboring masses of the various nationalities, it facilitates the uniting of these masses into a single state union. In that Soviet power, by its very structure, facilitates the task of leading the oppressed and exploited masses by the vanguard of these masses, by the proletariat, as the most united and most politically conscious core of the Soviets. The experience of all revolutions and of all movements of the oppressed classes, the experience of the world socialist movement teaches us, says Lenin, that the proletariat alone is able to unite and lead the scattered and backward strata of the toiling and exploited population. The point is that the structure of Soviet power facilitates the practical application of the lessons drawn from this experience. In that Soviet power, by combining legislative and executive power in a single state organization and replacing territorial electoral constituencies by industrial units, factories, and mills, thereby directly links the workers and the laboring masses in general with the apparatus of state administration, teaches them how to govern the country. In that Soviet power alone is capable of releasing the army from its subordination to bourgeois command, and of converting it from the instrument of oppression of the people, which it is under the bourgeois order, into an instrument for the liberation of the people from the yoke of the bourgeoisie, both native and foreign, in that the Soviet organization of the state alone is capable of immediately and effectively smashing and finally destroying the old, i.e., the bourgeois, bureaucratic, and judicial apparatus, in that the Soviet form of state alone, by drawing the mass organizations of the toilers and exploited into constant and unrestricted participation in state administration, is capable of preparing the ground for the withering away of the state, 
which is one of the basic elements of the future stateless communist society. The Republic of Soviets is thus the political form so long sought and finally discovered, within the framework of which the economic emancipation of the proletariat, the complete victory of socialism, must be accomplished. The Paris Commune was the embryo of this form. Soviet power is its development and culmination. That is why Lenin says, the Republic of Soviets of workers, soldiers, and peasants' deputies is not only the form of a higher type of democratic institution, but is the only form capable of ensuring the most painless transition to socialism. The peasant question. From this theme, I take four questions.